Okay, guys. So I think that we can start the, the webinar now. So let's start for introducing the panelists. So uh, it's Giovanni Pandolfi Bortoletto here. I'm one of the co-founders and CTO of Lispace. And with me today, it is also Jay Dialani, it is Business Development uh, Americas. Jay, if you want to, to give a, to say hello to the guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Uh, this is Jay Diolani. I lead uh, business development for Leaf Space in the Americas region. I'm located in Washington, D.C. Okay, thanks, Jay. So, uh, as you have seen the title, this webinar is focused on the ground station network cost structure. And it was born from many discussions that we had with our customers and possible customers about what what is the best way to go with uh, building or outsourcing the, uh, the ground segment or the ground station network for a particular mission. And uh, this has been, you know, build has been the only uh, solution that we have seen uh, at the start of the new space or the CubeSat uh, venture. So if you, if you know, of course, Spire and Planet start by building their own network uh, to operate their their constellation because at that time it was the only uh, solution that makes sense economically and also operationally uh, to their constellation operations. Uh, right now there are different solutions. Uh, list phase is one of those solutions and in this webinar we will go through how what to take into account of course to build up a cost structure of your own gun station network or what to, to take into account to go with a uh, uh, ground station or ground segment as a service provider and of course we have our secret sauce uh, that you will see in the in the cost structure so let's start from the from the basics uh, you know uh, there are a few drivers that you need to take into account to to evaluate the cost of your of your ground station network and for sure one of the first is the frequency bands that you're that you're going to use both for TTNC and payload downlink then of course there are the G over T and EIRP, so the figure of merits to, that you can that you need to have to evaluate the link budget on the frequency bands that you are operating. And of course, typically uh, all these drivers comes from the design of the space segment. Then of course you have throughput, so or the data rate that you're going to that you would like to have to communicate with your with your satellite, so both in uplink and in downlink. Typically for, you know, her for observation or uh, IoT application, typically is the downlink throughput that is driving the general uh, design of the ground station network. Although, of course, for uh, broadband applications, there is also the, uh, the data rate in uplink or the throughput in uplink that start to get consistent, of course. Then there is the... Um, uh, term of capacity, so the number of contacts per day per satellite that you want that you want to have, and this typically came through the kind of application that you're that you're doing. So, uh, Earth observation, you may have a certain amount of uh, of images of data that you need to downlink uh, every day or every orbit, and the same kind of thing also for IoT or narrowband or broadband communication, of course. Then there is the number of satellites. So if you're Going with a single satellite mission, of course, is just one. If you're going with a, with a constellation because you want to have lower revisit time, uh, whatever the application you have, uh, then of course you have a constellation. So the number of satellites, and we will see also later the kind of configuration of these number of satellites uh, in orbit, of course, drives the, the cost of the ground station network. Then we have the type of orbit, so SSO, low inclination, ISS, equatorial, whatever. This will drive the distribution of the network. And then of course the, the, mission, the mission duration. Then let's see uh, what, uh, which kind of drive will drive actually, and what will drive. So we see that the frequency bands and the G over T and ERP will drive the, the type of ground station. So generally speaking, uh, the diameter uh, of the of the antenna that we're going to use, uh, the kind of pedestal that we're going to use, always depending on the kind of uh, performances that we are that, that we're looking to. 
then the throughput and the protocol. And for protocol, I mean the actual communication protocol. Uh, will it be CCSDS or the VBS2 or maybe even a proprietary protocol? It, it will drive the base, the selection of the baseband equipment. Then, in some cases, can have quite a, a high impact on the on the overall cost. Then it will drive for sure the the throughput, the backhaul connection. So, if you want to have really low latency between the ground station when you downlink the data to the actual uh, cloud server when you're where, you, where you're processing the data or your own uh, mainframe. Of course, you need to to uh, design the backhaul connection to to allow this low latency. And then, of course, have a, an impact on the cloud in of cloud services that you're using if you're using cloud services, of course. Then the contacts per day per satellite will drive the ground station location and distribution, and then of course the number. Uh, like as the number of satellites that you're going to support and the type of orbit that you're going to support. All of these together with the mission duration will drive all your costs. So let's see also a kind of um, segmentation of the cost starting from the, from the CapEx that you have. So when you are starting your, your own ground station network, of course, the first thing that you should do is to actually do an architecture's design. So decide uh, which are the elements uh, of your architecture. So the ground station, maybe some services in the cloud to route the data or to process the data. Uh, and so on. So you need to do to have this architecture design in order to be sure which kind of elements are you putting uh, in the network. Then there is the, of course, the development of the interface software. For interface software, we mean both uh, the, uh, the the interface between the network itself and your uh, mission control software or your um, mission operation software for the for the satellite the satellite constellation but also the interface with the baseband equipment that you have uh, on the ground station itself then depending on your kind of architecture that you have selected and in principle from the uh, from your mission uh, you may need an orchestration software typically you always need that uh, but it depends uh, the kind of complexity, of course, is driven by how many satellites and how many ground stations are you actually uh, supporting. So you need this kind of software to, you know, schedule the activity of the network, schedule also the activity of your satellites, depending on that. Then you have mission and control, uh, management and control software. This is typically really a, a simple uh, GUI or whatever, just to see some parameters and act. Uh, on the network, of course, and depending on how, which which is your um, development and operation structure inside the company, it can be uh, more complex or less complex. Then there is a, a big chunk of capex that is uh, related to the ground station procurement, and typically also with uh, with the baseband equipment procurement uh, and shipping. You will see from uh, our use cases later that this is typically the most predo the predominant part uh, of the capex and of course it really depends on the kind of antenna that you uh, that you that you need uh, in your ground station network then there is a, a not non trivial part that is the site site research so actually uh, going around to select the sites of your ground station you can decide maybe if you have just one ground station, you know, you can put it on the roof of your, of your building if it's in a suitable location, or you may go through all the way to Antarctica to set up your own, uh, your own site because there is uh, nothing available there. So of course there is uh, trade-offs to be made, uh, but it's a quite, a big, uh, quite a big activity. And don't uh, underestimate, of course, also all the, uh, contextualization process that you have with, with teleports or other uh, site provider or co-hosting provider. Then of course there is the activation. So researching for a site is a thing. Activate the site uh, is another thing. So it takes it takes a while. And then of course licensing. Uh, as you may know, uh, there is a part of licensing that is the space segment. In this case, we are just uh, talking about the ground segment licensing. 
and depending of course on how many stations you will have around uh, and which country you will operate uh, there is a quite big chunk of work to to be done and as you may know licensing changes in every country that you that you may go there are of course different layer different levels of changing uh, but in some cases are quite substantial and you will be not surprised actually to get in some countries that doesn't have a clear process and you need to build up the process of course if the location is of interest for you and then last point is the actual installation of the ground station. So uh, building up the paths that you need, uh, putting down the fiber for connection, for backward connection, the power, UPS, and so on. So everything you need to actually uh, have a base, a pad ready for the ground station, and then the actual installation of the ground station. Then uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, I actually assume that uh you guys are procuring a, a, ground, a ground station or a set of ground station there is also the possibility to build your own okay so maybe you want to procure some parts from different vendors and then assemble and so on or even uh, develop your own the fact is that it depends will depends on your business if, it, if you're going to need a ground station network of you know 20 30 stations it could be maybe uh, smart to start doing it for for saving a lot on the on the upward price of the ground station, but otherwise uh, it's really really uh, I would say a mess, and you need to take into account a lot more of uh, ground station development cost and of course time from the start to when you have the system uh, up and running. Then. Looking at the OPEX, uh, you have, uh, we divided uh, the OPEX in different parts. So this part is for the, for the OPEX related to sites. And on the site, you need to take into account, of course, the rent of the, of the area that you're using. And depending on the teleport or the cost infrastructure that you, that you may use, you can start from having a, a square meter fee or maybe just a fixed fee uh, independent on the actual uh, on the actual area that you're occupying or maybe some other fees depending on the kind of applications that you're doing so there is really uh, quite a lot of difference uh, around but typically the square the uh, fee per square meter is the most used one then of course you have power because you, you should have power to to your ground station and you should have redundant power uh, in all our sites that we are that we that we use we have redundant power, both on uh, on a power line, so fixed power line, generators and UPS. In some cases, where we have also a diversity ring uh, power line coming in. And just a hint on that, uh, take also into account uh, how many hours or how many days of operation your site may have uh, under a generator because this is a quite a critical point in case of network disasters or others you don't want to lose connection on that same kind of uh, um, of discussion we can have also for the backhaul connection so as said before this is really driven by your throughput uh, throughput need so uh, you typically want to have a higher speed than what you are downlinking from the satellite of course in some cases it's not so easy and in some cases is not so cheap uh, to do but typically this is the uh, the rationale that, that you may use also here another hint try to have sites when you have um, a diversity path and it's not it's not just diversity path from a from a single operator try to have also two different operators to that it really saves you a, a lot of uh, a lot of issues and a lot of time uh, because Typically, when you are doing some, when they are doing some works around, the fiber is the first that get cut, basically. Then, of course, you have maintenance. Don't ever assume that you are putting a ground station and you're just forgetting. It can be done in some systems, but typically, you always need to do some uh, some inspections and be sure that everything is working. And in any case, you should be ready to have maintenance when you need it. Same thing for the spares. So it's always good to have some spares 
to, to change in case of failure, just to reduce the mean time uh, to repair. Then, of course, you have licensing fees. Uh, also here, I said before, it really changes a lot from one side or one country to the other. So there is not really a, um, an average value to be used, but it really changes a lot on which frequency band are using. Some countries use a, a bandwidth uh, estimation method for the licensing. Others are just fixed step uh, of license depending on your application. So have a look at that. Of course, all this thing needs to, needs to be uh, compared with the actual SLA that you have. Uh, if your SLA is not too high, maybe you can, you can uh, have lower prices, but I, I can assure you that it's always better to have kind of, kind of high SLAs and not have any other issue from coming from that. Then if you're using the cloud, and, and I hope you're using case, of course, you need to take into account these main, uh, these main points. Of course, there are a, a lot more in case, depending, of course, on the kind of architecture that you're using. But for sure, the first one is storage, uh, not just for the uh, you know, logging and telemetry data of your ground station uh, in general and your operation, but also for the data that is coming through the ground station. So maybe you want to store, to store them in for a few days or maybe for a few months, depending on the application that you're doing. And uh, typically, if you're operating the ground station network yourself, you may want to never delete any kind of data. Then you have, of course, data egress. You, you may know that all the cloud providers basically make you pay for every bit that is going um, outside of the cloud so you don't pay anything to get data inside but of course you pay for getting data outside so take take care about that and then of course there is a part of instances and services that in it really depends on the kind of um, operation and architecture that you have done uh, if you have really small small services that doesn't consume any uh, any big resource maybe your cost will not be too high and then you have, of course, uh, VPNs. If you uh, if you want to have, and, and, and I'm suggesting you to have a VPN connection to all your ground station, of course, these are costs that you need to take into account. And as said before, all these drives also your SLAs. So for example, in the Eastern Season Services, if you are running your service on uh, virtual machines, you can ha expect to have a certain SLAs. If you're running them in uh, Kubernetes or any other container or dockers, docking system, of course, your SLAs in general may be that better. It always depends on the kind of SLA that you want to have. Then, of course, the, la the last part of OPEX is actually the ones of operations of your ground station network. So I, I said it three times, but operators is the, is the main cost. So the actual people that you may have that actually stay uh, stay at the other console to, un to understand how the ground station and to operate the ground station network. And this, of course, can change uh, depending on your, your strategy, if you're using DevOps or if you're using um, site reliability engineers or whatever. It, cha it changes uh, a little bit, but in general, you, have, you need to have people taking care of your ground station network. And in some cases, you also need to have some facilities for that. Uh, of course, right now we have seen it during this pandemic, maybe it's not the best solution to have, to be restricted on certain facilities. Uh, in some cases, for some applications, uh, maybe it's the only way to go still. And also these SLAs. Just for an example, the number of operators you may need really drives the, uh, it's driven by the SLAs that you want to have. So let's get to the, to the numbers and let's have these uh, use cases that we came up with. So we have the first use case that is just a one single satellite in SS orbit, needing to have four contacts per day at 150 megabit per second with a link of 150 megabit per second in SNX band. Then we have another use case for the same satellite, but this time it needs to have 14 contacts per day, so mainly one per orbit. And this typically um, 
the uh, the need for uh, an Earth observation satellite. While the first use case is more for uh, maybe an Earth observation satellite, but in technology demonstration. Then we have a full constellation of 40 uh, SSO satellites in a configuration of eight satellites over five um, orbital planes. And here, every satellite will have 14 contacts per day, so one, one contact per orbit, 150 megabits per second, and always in SNX. Then let's start from the first case. So here you see, well, a lot of numbers. I'll try to be uh, as clear as possible. So the total uh, that you may spend with, uh, with this first case for a 36 months operation is 1 million euros. And I will get through all the details on why we get to this. So of course, first assumption is that we are using a, a single 3.7 meter SNX band buy from a, from a vendor. Okay, outside, so not built by ourselves. And you, you may see that if you're putting together the ground station procurement with the baseband equipment, that for that kind of data rate, if you're going with CCSDS, of course, there is a, there is a cost associated to that. If you're going with DVBS2, maybe you're going, to save, uh, you're going to save some money. But generally speaking, you have a lot of money put in this, in this, uh, this voice cost. Then you have all the developments. So you know, there is the Gun Station Network Design and the different software development. So these are activities that you can, of course, try to limit as much as possible since you maybe have, in this case, you have just one ground station to operate because you need just four passes per day. So one ground station in middle latitude should be okay. So you can really limit that. The uh, quite strong assumption that we have done right here is that you do the development once and then that's it. You don't develop it. You don't develop anything else. So this is quite a strong assumption, and is not really uh, it's not really real. <laughs> Sorry for the for this joke. It's not really real uh, on the uh, on an actual operation. So you're always there to do some uh, upgrades, update, or debug. Uh, then, as we said, we have the procurement. Then, of course, there is the site research and ground station installation. You see, the voice cost is quite limited because, of course, it's just, we are just talking on one site and, and one installation. Then we have the OPEX for the site. As you see, the rent is the, is the main one, basically. Then, of course, we have power, backhaul connection, and so on and so on. Just uh, some words on backhaul connection. The price really changes depending on the location that, we are, that you're using. So if you have a ground station in the middle, of a, of a big city, maybe it's not so critical to have a quite fast uh, internet connection, even though you ha may have other problems of interference or other permission to actually install the ground station there. So uh, take quite, uh, bear quite of attention here. Then on the, on the cloud part, uh, you see that the part of instances and services is the major one. Storage for the kind of throughput that we have and the number of, of passes that we made is quite, quite low. But of course, it depends also on how many days or how many, um, how many months you want to save your data. In this case, we have assumed that we are saving the data of one month. Uh, then for operations, as we said, main, main part is operators. In this assumption, since you have just one satellite, four passes per day, we assume to have two operators. Uh, doing actually, of course, these, this kind of work. Uh, maybe it's not perfect because you don't have 24 seven uh, coverage, but I think it's good enough for, for 24, for uh, four passes per day. The thing that you need to take into account, of course, is that people typically get, go in vacation or in some cases get healed. So you need to overcome that. Uh, you see that uh, also the division of CapEx versus OPEX, so one of the main thing that we uh, feedback that we get from our customers is that, of course, it's far easier to understand the uh, the capex part is less easier to understand the the opex part and the kind of distribution. You will see from this uh, from this example, but also the others, that typically the opex is the one driving your uh, your cost. So going on the second. Uh, uh, on the second use case, 
here the assumptions are quite similar. The only thing that we that we changed is the actual number of ground stations. So right now we need to support uh, 14 passes per day on a single satellite. So we have kind of three solutions. We go on a polar region with one single ground station, but with uh, OPEX uh, costs that will go quite high. Or we go on a not so polar, but maybe still high latitude couple of locations to work, or we go in middle, middle latitude location with five location to provide you the same kind of coverage. Uh, of course, is not the, uh, I, I agree with you guys, it's not the uh, most linear uh, solution, but we, we will see later that it will really get into, into a lot of savings when you have a lot more satellites. So you see here, of course, major part of the CapEx is dedicated to the ground station and basement equipment procurement and shipping. Then we increase, of course, the amount of the architecture design and the software development, because now you have five stations, one satellite and 14 passes per day. So you need to start to actually develop a, a better and more, more complex system to, to handle all these stations. And then of course, also the part of site success and ground station installation just increase linearly uh, with that. The OPEX part, of course, rent is still uh, the biggest one. Then you, you start to see also the other uh, spiking a little bit. Then cloud uh, is always the same kind of distribution. Uh, what is increasing here is the, uh, uh, sorry for that you don't see all these numbers, but uh, what is increasing is the number of operators. So right now is 14 passes per day. So you have really, ha really had 24 seven uh, operations. So at, you need to have at least three operators to support that. Of course, uh, as I said before, you can, it, it, it all depends on your SLAs, you know. So if you can, uh, if you can, uh, you're allowed to have some loss of service, maybe during the night, or something like that, it's okay to have less uh, operators. But if your application or your customer doesn't allow that, uh, you need to have more operators, operators with that, of course. And you see the CapEx versus OPEX. So this is a strange use case because of course we have just one satellite and the CapEx is, is, has increased a little bit, of course, because we have more stations to, to get on the ground. Then last case, here we, we have, you remember, 40 satellites with 14 passes per day per sat. And here we made the assumption to have eight ground stations uh, installed, okay? So the total amount is 6.6 .6 million euros for 36 months operation. You see that the capex is quite high, of course, because we have these eight ground stations. And the Y8, white eight ground station because of course we need to have five locations to support the 14 passes per day on a single sat here we have 40 satellites so we need also to increase not in all the location but in some specific location the number of ground stations to support that capacity and then of course all the architecture design development as said before really increase a lot because of course you're not handling more ground stations so eight with respect to five but also you're handling 40 satellites instead of just one. So there, your orchestration software needs to work really, really well, both in scheduling and also in routing of all the data that you're, that you're passing through the network. Then on the OPEX, still the same kind of distribution, of course, with the rent going is, is the first. In uh, OPEX, you see a quite, uh, on the cloud, you see quite a change because the instances and services is not yet is, is, is not still the, uh, the first one, but data egress and VPNs and also storage has started to, to grow a lot. Because, why? Because of course you have more satellites. So our total throughput is much, much more. And all this data that you're going to get out of the, of the cloud uh, is much more. Of course, uh, here there could be a trick. So if you're using the same cloud for the, for example, for Earth observation, if you're using the same cloud for Earth imaging processing, you don't need to actually aggress all the data, but you just need to aggress the data 
that you want to deliver to your customers. So in that case, of course, you can save a lot. VPNs, there's really nothing you can save on that. Uh, operators, same thing here. We increase uh, even more the number of operators because, of course, you have 40 satellites now and then 80 and eight stations. So you need to to be to have really really a faster response. Of course, depends in depending on your SLAs and so on. So let's see. You know, here you see a lot of numbers and a lot of voices. Let's see how these use cases can be seen uh, using one of uh, leaf space solutions, so leaf line and, and leaf key. So the kind of simplification is like this. So you don't, you basically have a really, really limited uh, capex that in this case for the first, for the first use case is the service readiness test. This is the, the test that we do uh, before the actual operation uh, of the satellite or before the service readiness review. So is the final test that we do to be sure that all the interfaces are, are running as they should and all the uh, RF is tuned as, the, as it should. And then we have just a, a cost voice of contact. So the actual passes that, you, that you're going to do, that's it. So as you see, the distribution CapEx versus OPEX is of course quite different. So you have 97% that is now OPEX compared to the, third, to the 3 percent is CapEx. And you have a huge, uh, we will see later how much huge, but you have a huge reduction on the actual, on the actual cost of the total mission. Why? Because in this case, of course, you're leveraging on someone else, in this case, us, to have built their own network and operate it. So you're not using a dedicated infrastructure uh, just for your mission, but you're leveraging on, on someone else's capacity. So in, in this case, our capacity. Same kind of thing for the, uh, for the second use case, uh, when, you know, even here, of course, the CapEx is really, really reduced because this is just a single satellite. The service readiness test is like the one before, so nothing has changed. It's just that the throughput uh, has changed quite a lot, the number and the number of satellites sorry, the number of passes has changed quite a lot. So even here, the cap, the OPEX is really growing towards the 100%. And as said before, the total amount is quite reduced for the same regions, for the same reasons that we said before. Uh, the third case actually start to not make sense anymore to probably use a leaf line. So the cost is quite this, the same uh, that as you have it to build your own in a, uh, in-house or, or our own. So we came up with a couple of years ago with a new service that is called LeafKey, that is a dedicated uh, ground segment as a service solution. And it starts to make sense economically when you have uh, quite a big, a big constellation. So in this case that we have 40 satellites constellation, it really makes sense. And we have a small part of CapEx that is typical enough from to cover for some sites research because we deploy the network um, tailored on, on your mission, and we add ground station as your as your constellation grows, and then we have a subscription part that is just basically a monthly fixed fee depending on the number of stations that you are using. And here we have a total of 3.5 million euros for 35, 36 uh, months operation, and you can see that really it's 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 basically all. OPEX, and sorry that you don't see the, the colors, but it's all OPEX, no worries about that. So just to work up a little bit on the use cases. So we have uh, the, the first case that for building is 1.02 uh, million euros with this distribution of CapEx and OPEX. The second one that is 3 million euros and the, the third one that is 6 million euros. And you can see that in the first case is basically uh, so the capex is 30, 40 percent. Then we have half and half, kind of half and half, and and then is again 33, 33 percent. If we um, compare it to an outsourcing strategy, and in case of course we live, this is the kind of numbers that we we can give you. This is the kind of reduction that we have, and it's quite uh, it's quite impressive, of course. 
and you can see the kind of savings in, in percentage. So we have 88% on the first two cases and 47% on the, on the last case. Um, but I think that the most important uh, savings that you can see, at least uh, from, a, from a startup point of view or in general from an uh, operational or commercially operational minded company, you have a shift from CapEx to OPEX because you see that here we have the 99, uh, well, in all the cases, we have near 98, 99% of reduction on CapEx. And talking as a, as a startup, as we are, of course, yeah, re reducing the CapEx is the best thing that you can, that you can do because, of course, you will uh, pay for OPEX when you actually, when you're actually operating it. So from an investor perspective, but in general as a business perspective, it's always better to move to, move to the OPEX, of course, in the kind of prices that are directly related to your commercial operation. So um, just a few conclusions. We have seen that uh, ground segment as a service solution and of course, leaf space solution in this case allows you to save, uh, well, a lot in all cases and uh, we can have even more cases uh, and different distribution and configuration of the satellite in general of course it, it makes sense and the savings uh, are mainly driven by the reutilization of the spare capacity as we said before and of course the avoidance of doing of the need to do some pre-ops development so for the uh, ground station network architecture uh, software development uh, and so on of course uh, with our solution, you don't need to develop any of those uh, of those things because, of course, it's something that we have developed and we are continuing to uh, to update and upgrade every time. Uh, and of course, as said before, it's mainly driven by the re reutilization of the spare capacity. So, of course, having for us having a network that we can use for different customers on on your perspective is much easier to to use than just building up your own network and of course, use just 1% or even less capacity uh, for, your, for your mission. And then, of course, there is no need or at least uh, a limited need for internal know-how. And, of course, no need to an having an extensive team for the uh, ground station network deployment uh, and operation. In that case, of course, you typically have, of course, a need to have internal someone that knows and how to knows how to interact with the ground station network provider of course for operations of your of your satellite segment but is there is not a need to have a dedicated team an extensive team to do that and then the last point i said before is that uh gssa yes, allows you to move from totally from capex to, to opex so to really pay what you use and expand and the the cost, of course, increase, but as your business increase. So, of course, uh, as you are, as we are, when we expand, we are more keen, of course, to pay more if this allows us to expand our, our business. Then, of course, this comes, uh, get us to, to the last question is why build, of course. And so many thanks for, for your attention. This webinar, I hope I didn't, uh, give you too much, uh, too much numbers, too much information, or at least uh, just valuable information. Uh, we'll get to a Q&A uh, session. Of course, you can use uh, your Q&A. Giovanni, we have, a, we have a few yeah. questions already. So uh, the first question is, why would technologies such as VPNs have an OPEX cost? Yeah. So, Typically, when you establish a VPN, and it depends, of course, on how you want to establish uh, the VPNs doing the, uh, to the different ground stations, and typically it's from the ground station to the cloud service that you're using, you will use some uh, public cloud uh, services for VPNs. And of course, these come to a cost. Typically, the cost is related on the actual traffic that you're passing through the, the VPNs. If you are, if you can, of course, if you want, you can also avoid to um, to have a VPN through the cloud. Uh, but in that case, of course, you need to actually pass through a physical router or a physical switch 
Um, then of course need to be redundant, uh, need to be made redundant in some way. So yeah, maybe you can have a saving. You don't have the same, you can have also a decrease in SLAs. We have uh, uh, another yeah. question uh, on, on the chat. Which cloud providers does Leafs, Leaf partner with? So right now we use uh, Google Cloud Platform, but we are quite uh, cloud agnostic in the sense that we started with, uh, well, actually we, back in the days we started with Azure, then we moved to Google Cloud Platform, but all our cloud software is now running on Kubernetes. So we can really move from one cloud provider to the other quite uh, quite easily. We we don't have any uh, deep relationship with any cloud provider. Yeah, and to extend on that uh, on the uh, on that question is you know uh, we can terminate the connection to any cloud provider, be it AWS or Azure or Google or even a private uh, private data center. So wherever the customer needs data to be sent, um, we can we can send it there. It's just a, an endpoint that we have to define in our system, in our scheduling system, and uh, all data will be routed securely to that endpoint. Yeah, thanks, okay, uh, we, have, we have more questions. Um, is it a possibility, this is coming from Ramesh, is it a possibility that we can invest and set up a ground station in partnership with LeafSpace? And then work out a revenue share model with leaf space, more like a franchisee model. Do you want me to take that question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Ramesh, great question. Um, definitely uh, interested in in talking more about it because you know there are a lot of uh, gears and dials that uh, we need to understand uh, in, within that question. So um, we'll be sure to reach out to you. Um, I. I think we have your email uh, because you registered for the webinar. So I'll make a note to reach out to you personally. Okay, uh, we have we have another question. Um, uh, we have the question is saving on the OPEX um, much better than saving on the uh, CapEx. Um, the uh, Hamid wants confirmation is is saving on the OPEX much better than saving on the CapEx. Well. Uh, this is a tricky, well, I, what I said before is that of course, as a startup in general, or in, in general, a, st a starting endeavor will not be a startup or even a big company starting a new business in the satellite segment. Um, you want to have costs that are really driven by how many business you are actually doing. Okay, so uh, CapEx is all the thing that you need to invest before and actually betting on the business that, that you will have and of course, it's something that you can do. You need to have the financial support to do that. Um, if you are a big company, maybe that's, that's not a problem, so you can do that. Um, OPEX, of course, uh, has a, a, a big part, of course. Uh, a part that in general, in the discussion for us is that we are saving a lot in, in, in all the cases. But in general, OPEX, uh, it's really related for, to how much business you're doing. So taking the example of the satellite, if you're paying the same, you're not paying the same OPEX for a satellite doing that is doing four, four passes per day, then the same satellite is doing 14 passes per day, okay? And typically if you're doing 14 passes per day, it is because you're downlinking more data and you need to downlink more data because you have more customer. So in that case, if you want, you are willing to pay more on OPEX just because you have more customers to so of course, it's not just paying more OPEX uh, full stop. It's paying more OPEX, of course, having on the other side more value or more data or more passes uh, as you want, of course. Of course, let me know if this answers your question. All right, we have another follow-up question. Uh, what is the perfect distance between the main ground station and a redundant ground station? Well, it, there is not a, a, simple, a simple answer to that. Uh, typically, it's, it's better to, to have, in a, in a, I would say, in another country or at least just outside to a few kilometers outside to have also a kind of 
let me call it diversity path or to increase at least your link availability with, with your with your satellite if you have two stations that are just 100 kilometers apart well it, it works really well as a redundant solution a fully redundant solution uh, but it does it doesn't give you more access to your satellite so if you have instead another station that is at least well i would say uh, 500 or 800 kilometers from from the from the main ones it's it gives you not just redundancy but gives you also much more link availability in terms of just uh barely speaking minutes per day uh, of contact so giovanni i think it is assuming that it should be in the same county or i think on the same on the same ground station um site okay yeah so in the same in the case of same ground station uh, you need to to be sure that at least the the major things that fail, so typically power and internet connection, are coming from another at least another mean or another provider. I don't know, Jay. Okay, if you want so to add we something. have. Uh, no, I I think that makes uh, perfect sense. So we have a uh, uh, we have a uh, couple more questions. Uh, do we foresee a near future where a satellite operator will not build any more ground stations and just rely on ground segment providers like LeafSpace? What about the potential cost to maintain more than one integration with different providers? Do you want me to take that question, Giovanni? Yep, please, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, so the, uh, this is uh, not the future we are talking about. This is already in motion. Uh, a lot of new satellite operators, new space satellite operators, are not building their ground stations. They are, in fact, relying on ground segment providers like us, like other other uh, providers around the world, um, and their distributed ground uh, ground systems to provide connectivity to their satellites. Um, Regarding the potential cost to maintain more than one integration with uh, different providers, uh, that that is a great point, um, and it really depends on you know um, which ground station locations do you need for for the satellites that you operate and own and operate. It really depends on the orbit type. It really depends on uh, the licensing you're able to obtain in certain countries. Depends on the locations that can uh, host a ground stay uh, host a ground station. So, like Leaf Space, um, you know, we we work with our customers to uh, you know if there are custom locations or preferable locations that uh, satellite operators have, we will work with them to host antennas at those sites, just not at uh, the 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 our usual dedicated leaf line and leaf key sites, uh, but dedicated antennas anywhere that the customer would like. So in that case, we we remove that potential cost of integrating with different providers. But yeah, if you have to, to uh, integrate, yeah, yeah sure, go, no, right. go ahead. I, I want to add also that uh, it depends also on your strategy on the mission control software or the or the mission control center uh, that that you're using or you want to use. Because if you're using, for example, um, commercial uh, off-the-shelf mission control software. Uh, typically, they are already integrated by, with us, and they can also be already integrated without some other vendor of a ground, ground station as a service. So, in that case, you, on your side, you don't do, you don't need to do anything. So, you have already a system working with that. Of course, uh, as Jay said, it really gets to uh, how to select the the different vendors. So, if having a primary and a backup, or having will hot redundant system on two vendors of course this changes a little bit uh, uh, the way to do but of course it's it's for sure possible as as Jay said is actually what some of our customers are already doing okay uh, we have we have a couple more questions so could cost savings be achieved by not deploying customer systems to a cloud Sounds like not having the egress fee services, et cetera, would be a significant saving. Well, uh, yes, you can do it. I'm not sure that you will actually save uh, save a lot. So uh, just uh, frankly speaking, uh, if you have a small, a small mission or a, a, small, uh, a small companies in, in general, maybe it doesn't make sense to build up your own uh, mainframe or your own 
small data center to do that. Also because typically one data center, and for that center, I mean, maybe just a couple of servers, uh, it's not enough. It's not enough for redundancy because if you lose a, a facility, you lose everything. So at least you need to have uh, two redundant uh, data centers, probably also distributed, uh, regional distributed at least. So I, and for all the kind of services that cloud provider provides you and you don't need to build up uh, from, from scratch, I think that at the end of the day, it always uh, save you, uh, maybe if not some money, uh, a lot of time, then at the end of the day is money. So, and of course you can be, you can start much, much faster. And you know, in, in this market, as fast as you get to the actual commercial market, uh, the better it is. Then of course, if you want to start with a really simple solution, that's, that's possible to you to do. Okay. okay, we have uh, one, one more question, which is the last one. What factors are considered while choosing a ground station site? Okay, so uh, different factors. One, and I think the, the first one is for, for sure licensing. So you need to be sure that on the country that you're operating, and in some cases, is even in the region, in the region or local, uh, locality that you're operating or you want to operate, you, you are able to get the license that you need. Uh, because for example, there are really different, uh, even if the general te telecommunication or spectrum allocation is under ITU uh, in, our, in the world, there are of course uh, different applications of the same guidelines uh, for different countries. For example, in Europe, it's much easier to, to operate in S-band for TTNC up and down on the space operations allocation. In US, it's, it's quite difficult, if not impossible, to get S-band downlink uh, licensing. So you really need to address licensing first, or at least have a clear understanding of the process and the frequencies that you, that you may use. Uh, then, of course, there is uh, the, the second good point is really the location. So longitude and latitude. Is that location good for your kind of application. So maybe it's a, it's a polar, uh, a near polar high latitude location for your SSO, it's perfect. If you're going to mid latitude or near equatorial, that's not gonna work, that's not going to work. So you need to take care of that. Then of course, it depends, uh, the specific location depends also if you're just going with a single ground station uh, configuration or if you want to have a network, that of course is better for redundancy. Because if you have a network, maybe you need to take care, uh, you need to take into account, sorry, all the network distribution, not just a single, a single location. Then the other, the other parts, as, uh, as I said before, is power and backhaul connection. If you are near, uh, let me call it internet node, uh, it's, much, it's much better because you can get access to really fast uh, backhaul connection at relatively low price. And typically you have even more uh, chance to get a diversity path for both power and an internet connection. But I would say that on, on these topics, typically it really gets to the diversity path and every a good price to get that. Okay. Okay, uh, we do not have any more questions, but we do have a couple minutes. So if anybody has any last minute questions, please uh, type them in the question and answer section. Yep. And I just want to, to add that tomorrow we will have another webinar at 4.30 uh, Central European Summer Time. Uh, let, I will check which time is for mountain time, but it should be, let me check. Well, anyway, I will I will let you know. But it's about cybersecurity. You probably have seen that we are partner, partnering with SISEC. It is a Swiss company providing cybersecurity solutions, uh, generally in finance or other applications. And they started to apply that to the, uh, to the space market. And we will talk about cybersecurity and how uh, this solution with SISEC will make not only 
uh, the uh, leaf line or leaf key ground station network that already have different layers of cybersecurity, but in general, the overall operations from, from the satellite to your mission control software um, layers, all of these encrypted and, and with a root of trust uh, on the satellite. Uh, we know that cybersecurity is not so uh, well, a uh, well uh, discussed point in the, in the space sector in general, but getting more and more in a commercial endeavor in general is something that we need to, we need, uh, we as a market need to take it, of course, into account because starting with commercial operation, we are more and more prone to cyber attacks. So this is for sure uh, a thing to, uh, to remember. I don't know, Jay, if you want to add something. Yeah, so uh, tomorrow, 4.30, uh, 4.30 Mountain Time, uh, 5.30 Central Time, uh, and uh, 6.30 uh, Evening Eastern Time. So uh, that will be our uh, third and last webinar uh, for the week. So the other, the two other, there's one more question, uh, Giovanni, that uh, yep. I think we have um, a minute for. What's your take on mobile launches? Yeah. So this is a really good question. And you may have seen that we have done, started a couple of partnerships with, uh, with launch vehicle providers. And we are looking a lot into the launch vehicle uh, market because of course the kind of support that we can provide is, is the same that we can, in some cases that we can provide to the, to the satellite sector. So always ground segments of the service, in this case will be launch vehicle tracking as a service. In particular, uh, with, these two, with these two companies, we are looking to develop a mobile ground station that we will be able to move around uh, on the specific launch sites where the launch vehicle will be uh, for, for its operation. So for sure, it, it's interesting. And I think it's, uh, you know, on the, also on that, on the CapEx side of the, of the launch vehicle strategy, will really reduce it. And, enables uh, some fast, uh, fast deployment system, not to, just on the ground to launch, but also on the, sat on the, on the, on the space uh, to, to launch the satellite where, wherever it's possible or whenever uh, it's possible. And of course, uh, every launch vehicle need uh, a telemetry tracking in, in some, in, uh, of course, in, in all cases, because otherwise it's not able to, to see the actual uh, trajectory, telemetry or whatever, uh, of the of the launch vehicle, and for sure, it's an interesting part uh, for us. Don't know, Jay, if you want to add something else. Yeah, and with the you know with the proliferation of uh, spaceports uh, opening up anywhere and everywhere around the world, you know they need not have as defined an infrastructure on the ground uh, with the mobile ground stations uh, to to serve their customers, which is which are the primarily the launch vehicles, thereby also reducing the costs and increasing the flexibility of the launch vehicle to be transported and launched from that site. Perfect. So we, we are really taking that problem, uh, that customer pain point head on and, and uh, you know, coming up with a solution that will be ideal to both the spaceports as well as the launch vehicles. Good. I, I don't know if you have any other, any other questions for, for this webinar. Uh, otherwise, we are we will really welcome you to to join our next webinar tomorrow on on cybersecurity. Yeah, and and everyone just feel free to reach out to us um, on LinkedIn or email from our website for any follow up questions you may have. Uh, I know we are a bit a couple of minutes over, over our time limit, uh, but here's the here's the contact information. Uh, for Giovanni and for myself, uh, please feel free to reach out for any questions, and uh, we will, you know, uh, we will respond accordingly. And yes, uh, we will we will share the presentation with uh, all the attendees within the week. Yeah. Perfect. So many thanks to everyone to have participated in this webinar. Hope to see you tomorrow. Have a good evening, afternoon, or morning, whatever. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.